Chapter 16 of Deliver Me from Ava by Paul Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Chapter 16 My awakening was hideously slow. The sleep had been of the blackest, most dreamless sort, and my return to consciousness came in midst of darkness. I felt no pain, but I could not move. Wherever I was, my hands and legs were pinioned so securely that motion was impossible. My fingers and toes I could wriggle, but try as I might, I could raise neither arms, legs, or neck. With return of thought from chaos, I endeavored to ascertain how badly my scalp was wounded, whether it was shrouded in dressings, marred or disfigured. Denied movement and the chance to explore, only imagination could fill the gap, and so surrounded was it by the appalling darkness that soon it became malignantly depressing. My lips were dry and I was thirsty. Knowing the conditions imposed for post-operative safety, I could be patient on that score. Important thing was that, apparently at least, I had awakened in full possession of my reasoning faculties, and that augured well for the success of Dr. Craner's experiment. But the darkness seemed totally unnecessary to my arousal. I cried out Margot's name. It echoed into silence, and neither voice nor footsteps answered it. "'Castleman!' I called. "'Hello, Castleman!' And all was silent as before. Buried in darkness, helpless to move, I lay there for what seemed hours. "'Castleman! Margo! Anybody!' Periodically I would call, and my voice would echo back tauntingly, maliciously. Why I was alone, why no one was about, were questions my anxious mind conjured but could not answer. As the unfruitful hours wore themselves away, curiosity turned to numbing fright. Before the room slowly lightened with the dawn, I lay cowed and sweating in genuine fear. Daylight showed itself first from the ceiling, and the brightening skylight was proof I still lay in surgery. The blue light no longer glowed, and my eyes, from the limited scope of my body shackles, strained to discern the graying objects about the room. I lifted my chin from the head clamp. I peered backwards to where the doctor had positioned himself before my sleep. I saw nothing but the dim, round wall, and my vision was so curtailed his pedestal could not be seen. Helpless. And genuinely worried, I sweltered and ached away the measured pass of time. The one thing left me was an occasional unanswered call for help, which eventually was bartered for the slow and silent wait upon full arrival of the day. By constant sidewise movement of my head, I gradually loosened the shackles enough for limited view to the right and left, and the first object to center itself to my vision and attention was dark and long, and propped against the south portion of the atelier's circular wall. Daylight confirmed what my fears had already whispered through to suspicion. It was a human body, and it was Castleman. Though, minus its head, I knew it was Castleman, by its blood-drenched gown and trousers. The decapitated torso, propped to floor and wall, had shared my company throughout that sorry night. Painfully I twisted my shackled head away from the gory corpse, wondering at the same time, and just as painfully if Dr. Craner and Margot had met similar fate. I could see now that instrument stands, trays, and cabinets were overturned, and that the room was in shambles. Alive or dead, there was no sign of either of Ava's parents. On the door to the north through which I had entered, a great splotch of blood now contrasted strangely against its pale sky tint. Glaring from the floor immediately below was Castleman's head, eyes open, lips wide apart, Instantly I knew that someone had thrown the head, and it lay where it had bounced from the door. I wondered why I, the most helpless one, had come through the bloody chaos alive. By what vague miracle had I been spared this ghastly ending? The deathly scene about me drove up one thought, to flee the room before my sickening fears consumed me. I shouted again and again for help, and each time my voice echoed back unanswered. For what seemed endless hours, I strained and labored at my straps and shackles. I grew faint from thirst and exhaustion. My own frantic shouts throughout that day finally convinced me that I alone remained at the cradle of light. I fought against the crushing finality of this knowledge, and the wasting horror of what lay ahead. I could not, I dared not, surrender. Every thought, every motive, focused down to a single overwhelming want— to get out of that accursed room. By mid-afternoon my throat was croaking with dryness. Every limb was numb from the shackles. 
I was hysterical with fright and totally exhausted. Sleep came as the most profound and blessed relief. End of chapter 16